Okay. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, so welcome very much uh, to our forum this afternoon. And how many people are students at the Kennedy School? Okay. How many people are graduates of the Kennedy School? How many people are donors to the Kennedy School? How many people are prospective donors? <laughs> okay, prospective donors, anybody? Okay. Uh, hopefully we'll have more of you after we hear from uh, the, the individuals we have here. Uh, I'm David Rubenstein, and I'm very pleased to be the chairman of the capital campaign the Kennedy School is launching. And I wanted to uh, welcome everybody to this session. For those who don't know, this is the uh, JFK Junior Forum. It was originally uh, built, this building was built in 1978, renamed the JFK Junior Forum in 2003 in honor of John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, many people have come here and made presentations, and we have very distinguished people here uh, this evening, or this, this afternoon. Um, over the years, there are about 75 official forum events, and almost everybody who is prominent in government or politics or public affairs has probably been here at one point in time. Uh, my favorite story is when uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was here. Some of you may remember, um, some of you may have seen him. Uh, he was here, and when he was asked by a student once, uh, very uh, quickly uh, came up with a great answer, and some of you may have heard about this. Uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was asked, well, by a student, how would the world be different if Nikita Khrushchev had been assassinated in November of 1963 rather than John Kennedy? And without missing a beat, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev said, well, I can't tell for sure how history would be different. Nobody can really be certain about that. But I do know for certain that Aristotle Onassis would not have married Mrs. Khrushchev. So, our special guest today is Larry Summers. Uh, over the past quarter century, I don't think anybody has had a greater impact on economic policy making in the United States than Larry. And he's been able to show that you can be a great academic and a great policy maker. Uh, Larry uh, got his undergraduate degree at MIT, but got his PhD at Harvard and uh, quickly became the youngest tenured professor at Harvard at the age of 28. Um, he then rose up to uh, status such that he won the John Bates Clark Medal for the most accomplished economist in the country uh, uh, under the age of 40. And then later went off to be the chief economist at the IMF, later the undersecretary for international affairs at the Treasury Department, later deputy secretary of Treasury, then secretary of Treasury, and then after that came back to be the 27th president of Harvard University. Following his ten five year tenure as president of Harvard University, he returned to public life and became the head of the National Economic Council for the first two years of the Obama administration and dealt with all of the many complex issues that, that, that faced that administration at the beginning of its term. Uh, since returning to academic life, uh, Larry has been involved in a variety of ac activities, but he is the Charles Eliot University professor at, at Harvard. He's also involved in, in the board of Teach for America and the Broad Foundation. But his most significant accomplishment is he is now the uh, Denny and uh, Frank Weil Director uh, at the Center for Business and Government at the Kennedy School. And all the accomplishments he has pale behind being involved with the Kennedy School. I think Larry would agree with that. Uh, he will be interviewed by Zanny Mitten Fedos, who is the uh, economics editor of The Economist. Uh, she will soon become the business affairs editor of The Economist and move back to her native England, but she's been resident in Washington for about 20 years now and been involved in a variety of uh, things at The Economist, served as the American economy editor, the emerging markets economy editor. She also worked at the IMF. She is a graduate of Oxford, and most importantly, though, on her resume is that she's a graduate of the Kennedy School, MPA. So, leave it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Well, it's great to be back here. I have very, very fond memories of sitting all up there in very intense study groups, and I haven't been back uh, that much since. But it's really wonderful to be back to a place that quite literally changed my life. And I'm sure that's true for many of you as well. This is a wonderful institution, and it's, it's really great to be back here, and it's great to be back for such a fantastic event to discuss the power of ideas to change the world, and uh, to do so with someone no other than Larry Summers. 
And the little secret, I'll, I'll let you into a secret about The Economist, which is it's actually not full of particularly smart people, but it's full of people who are able to find brilliant people and ask them questions. And whenever I want to, whenever I'm a bit stumped by an article, really whatever the subject, the person I'd most like to talk to, if I'm feeling up to it, is Larry. Uh, I've never had a conversation with Larry in which I haven't felt intellectually inadequate. <laughs> Quite often actually dumb. Um, but I've never had a conversation where I haven't learned a lot, whatever the subject is. And I suspect you will find that this morning will be no different. And I was delighted yesterday, I was coming back from London and I was reading Tim Geithner's stress test. And I haven't yet got to the bits where he's rude about you, Larry, so I can't comment about those. But at the very beginning, uh, he describes, Tim Geithner describes Larry, and he did in a way that, I, that really resonated. Uh, he said, and I quote, this is Tim Geithner on Larry Summers, he would tell you why you were wrong, how you should have made your argument, and why your improved argument would have been wrong. <laughs> but he didn't mind being challenged, as long as you didn't mind being challenged back without excessive courtesy. He had an inspiring sense of possibility when it came to public policy, an assumption that evidence-based analysis could always produce a better way. It seems to me that this is the perfect person to have a conversation to capstone a discussion of the power of ideas. But Larry, before we can talk about the power of ideas to improve the world, I'd like to know what your sense is of what the main challenges we should be focusing on. And a few weeks ago, you wrote in the Financial Times, the unfortunate reality is that medium-term prospects for the global economy have not been so problematic for a long time. What do you mean by that? And what are the big problems in the world economy that we should be focusing on? Zanny, let me uh, first return a little bit of the compliments by saying oh, no, that this is going to become a compliment fest. You have to by saying that while The Economist has um, anonymously authored articles, it's been my observation as a close reader of The Economist who periodically offers an opinion or two about what The Economist has said, that if I think something has been written that is smart, there's a very high probability that you wrote it. And if I think something has been written that's dumb, it's not the case uh, that you have uh, written it. So that is a tribute to you, but on behalf of the Kennedy School's 1992 faculty, I will also take some credit uh, for them uh, for uh, the wisdom uh, that, uh, is exp that is expressed. Uh, and I would say also that my friend David was um, kind enough to reference the fact that over the course of my career, I've gone back and forth a certain amount between academia and government. And people would ask me when I was in government, what was different about government than life in the academy? And I would say, well, roughly speaking, as a professor at Harvard, the worst thing you could do was to sign your name to something you had not written yourself. On the other hand, as a government official, it was a mark of effectiveness to do so as frequently as possible. <laughs> and then, when I returned to Harvard to be its um, president, people would say, well, what's different about being the president of Harvard than uh, working in Washington? And I gave an answer that, in retrospect, was breathtaking in its naivete. I said, the thing about Washington is that it's so political. Um, I'm really glad to have a chance to, partici uh, to participate, uh, to, to participate uh, in this event. And I might just uh, say that while I was president of Harvard, I did many things. Uh, some are seen as wise, others are seen as uh, less wise. But appointing David Elwood as the dean of the Kennedy School is quite universally seen as a wise act. And it's one that I'm very proud uh, to have made. Sandy, I think from a uh, macroeconomic uh, perspective, looking to uh, the medium term, there are three broad challenges in the global uh, economy. And I'll give them in the order that I feel them. Uh, the first is achieving adequate demand 
to support reasonable rates of growth and the possibility of full employment, to avoid uh, what I've referred to as the new secular stagnation associated with uh, lack of demand and uh, the liquidity trap as a binding constraint. The second is rising inequality and the availability of jobs for all in a world where machines and technology are moving substantially upscale in the capacity for what they're able to do. And so there's more leverage if you're very able and there's less opportunity uh, if, uh, you're, uh, if you're not. Think about the publishing industry as an example. It used to be that there were publishers and wholesalers and distributors and bookstores. Then there were superstores. Then there was Amazon shipping books. Now there's Amazon electronically transmitting books. At every stage in that process, it was better to be a reader and it was better to be a great author. And at every stage in that process, it was worse to be a person of ordinary talent somewhere near the book industry because opportunity was being diminished. And that's the kind of transformation that is happening pervasively. And that's why there are more superstars making a billion dollars because there's more leverage there. And that's why there's more pressure on the middle class and the poor. That's the second large challenge. And the third uh, large uh, challenge is um, making governments work effectively and sustainably to support our society. A crucial part of that but not the only part of that is their financial health because without long-term financial health, you can't really do anything else and you run the risk of a vicious cycle where you cut back because you have no choice and then confidence diminishes and then the willingness to provide resources diminishes and then you cut back and you have a vicious cycle. But it is also the challenge of finding ways of solving increasingly complex problems, the solution to which does not lie in uh, any single uh, in any single sphere, problems that cannot be solved by government alone, problems that cannot be solved uh, by uh, business uh, alone. So effective governance, a inclusive uh, prosperity, and a satisfactory rate of growth are, I think, uh, the great macroeconomic challenges uh, going forward. And I think probably are a larger fraction of the economic policy challenges going forward than has been the case. Because while it's not often seen this way and it's not remarked, I would say that if you took the sectoral challenges, we are actually in significantly better shape than we were six years ago. Energy independence and energy exports are now within view in a way that would have been inconceivable six years ago. We're uncomfortably and uneasily lurching towards universal health care, and we've had much more progress in containing health care costs than we did. Finance still faces huge challenges, but there's a much more satisfactory regulatory regime that is in place than it was. So at the sectoral level, we've actually seen some substantial progress, but those three large macroeconomic challenges very much loom before us. Let's, um, <clears throat> they give a very good framework for where we should have this conversation go, but let's start with the first one. Um, and 
the secular third nation term that he did not coin. It was coined, in fact, Alvin Hansen coined it here in 1938. Uh, Hansen predicted that there would be secular stagnation in the US because essentially for demographic reasons. After the, the, the rapid increase in the population in the 19th and early 20th century, the, the slowing would mean that secular stagnation. He was spectacularly wrong. Um, I, what, is, what are the underpinnings of your phrase, secular stagnation? Why do you think growth is going to be weak and remain weak? Couldn't one also make an argument that the past few years have simply been the hangover from a huge financial crisis, and once one gets beyond that, we should expect aggregate demand to return to somewhere more normal? And if, if it's not going to, what are the secular reasons that you think lie behind persistent and pervasive weak demand? I think there are two parts, I think there are two parts of that. Um, one is that we now have much lower inflation than we had in the past. And in fact, through the happy last 60 years, we not infrequently had negative real interest rates. And it's much harder to have negative real interest rates when the underlying inflation rate is in the one, one and a half percent range than it is when it's significantly above that. So quite apart from any structural change in what real interest rates need to be, their capacity to fluctuate is lower because of an underlying rate of inflation. The second is a whole set of structural changes that it seems to me have operated to raise the propensity to save and to reduce the propensity to invest and therefore to push towards contraction. On the higher savings side, you have the redistribution of wealth towards those with a higher propensity uh, to save associated with more inequality. You have the substantial increase in the desire for reserve accumulation on the part of a large number of emerging markets, which is a source of savings uh, to uh, the global economy. You have a sense that people are going to live uh, longer and that old age is less secure and government entitlements are less reliable, all of which leads to an increase in the propensity to save. On the investment side, you have what one might think of as the demassification of the economy. Think about Sony. It was a regular traditional company. It is a regular traditional company with lots of factories and buildings and office buildings and tens of tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people working for it and research labs and all of that. And it is worth $18 billion. Think about WhatsApp. It could, it could function very comfortably entirely within the Rubenstein building across the courtyard. The whole thing, the whole company. It's worth $19 billion. Think about the way in which AT&T or GE or IBM were borrowing money and issuing stock in order to invest on a substantial scale during the eras when they were America's leading company. And think about how Apple is awash in cash, which it doesn't quite know what to do with, or Google is a wash in cash that it doesn't quite know what to do with today. Think about the difference between shipping things from the cloud electronically to your PC and, the, and building malls where you can go shop uh, for them. All of these things mean that the functions performed by investment absorb far less saving than uh, they used to, not to mention the fact that the size of the labor force is gonna grow much less rapidly going forward. So all of these things point towards more savings and less investment that points towards a demand problem. Now, those are sort of theories and arguments and, and so forth. I think there are two other things that are worth looking at. I think what did not get the attention at the time and still does not get the attention it should is the economic experience of the United States or for that matter the industrialized world between 2004 and 2007. Growth was okay. It was 
Maybe you'd even say it was good. You could not plausibly say it was great. And you certainly could not say that the economy, in terms of job creation or product production, um, was overheating. And yet, what did we have? We had the mother of all housing bubbles, vast erosion of credit standards, what was regarded ex post as having been far too easy money, and what was regarded ex post as having been profligate tax cuts with the Bush tax cuts. And all of that taken together was only enough to get you to adequate growth. Before that, you had the 2001 recession. Before that, you had the internet bubble. So if you ask, when was the last time the United States was growing strongly from full employment without, with sustainable financial conditions, plausibly you're looking back 15 to 20, uh, 15 to 20 years, one kind of ground for concern. The other is if you just look at what the market is saying about where real interest rates are going to be going forward, that's been trending downwards uh, for a long time. Now, Alvin Hansen, go ahead. Go ahead, no, 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 carry on, carry on. Now, now Alvin Hansen turned out to be wrong because of a few things. We fought World War II, which jump-started the economy. We didn't let people buy cars or houses or appliances for four years because of the war effort, which created a huge pent-up demand to spend. We created vast national projects, the building out of American suburbia, most prominently, and the equipping of the American house of the American household, then the interstate highways, then uh, the interstate highway system, and the um, rendering uh, much more capital intensive of all sorts of all sorts of businesses. So those things, things like that could happen again. But if you extrapolate uh, the current path, we're going the other way on infrastructure. We're going the other way on uh, housing. We're going the other way on uh, optimism, on pessimism uh, versus optimism. And that's why I have the kind of concern uh, that I do. If you're right, this is, a, this is a profound shift from the last, sort of from the post-war era, and, to, and a profound shift from how people normally think of the economic challenges to be faced. If you're right on demographics, it means that rather than worrying about the burden of the aging population, we should be worrying about the excess saving it's created. And if you're right, it means that innovation now no longer leads to higher investment. And you know, I'm sure when I was back here a long time ago, I learned that one would expect the prospect of greater innovation to lead to higher investment. Your response to that, your solution, has been more public investment. I mean, that's basically what you've advocated. Is that, in, is that a bold enough solution? And what kind of public investment are you talking about? What scale? Because these are huge secular changes you're talking about. If you're right, surely it means a sort of fundamental rethink of the scale of government. So I'd say a couple things. Uh, first, uh, what, I've tried to, what I've tried to say is that we need more public investment and more private investment. And that, as I said fairly constantly during the Obama administration, uh, confidence is the cheapest form of stimulus. And if you take what's probably the most obvious opportunity for the United States uh, right now, it's uh, in energy where with the right level of investment, we could be Saudi Arabia six years from now with all the geopolitical implications of our having the kind of position in the world that Saudi Arabia had uh, for many years. And that's not about public investment, that's about establishing a framework in which private investment uh, can take place. I've remarked often on the fact that um, if a moment when 
Kennedy year, if a moment when the uh, long-term interest rate is below 2.5% in a currency we print, and the construction unemployment rate is in double digits, isn't the moment to fix Kennedy Airport. I don't know when that moment will come. But it's also true that, and I can tell you this from my experiences of the last six months, that it is easier to call my office from a car going from Heathrow into London, going from the Beijing airport into Beijing, or going from the Almaty airport into Almaty in Kazakhstan than it is to call my office from a car going from Dulles Airport into Washington, LaGuardia Airport into New York, or Logan Airport into Boston. And that is a private infrastructure uh, investment uh, challenge. So I don't think that uh, if one thinks broadly about uh, infrastructure to refer not just to roads but to uh, pipelines, not just to uh, ports but to uh, telecommunications, not just to airports but to uh, broadband, I don't think having a leading infrastructure is the work of a year, certainly not the work of doing the shovel-ready projects of a moment. It's not the work of a single, of a single presidential uh, administration. It's the work of having a society uh, that is organized uh, somewhat differently uh, than the way ours currently is. I'm going to come to why that's not happening in a minute. Just first a little aside, we crunched some numbers a few weeks ago and we found that 60% of people who fly out of the US land at a better airport than they took off from. Um, just and if you did that, and if you did that calculation for those who flew from what arguably is the new Ellis Island, Kennedy Airport. I suspect you would get a. I suspect uh, you would get a. Uh, you would get a substantially higher number. And if you asked about the best mass transit alternative into the center city versus the mass transit alternative that took you uh, to the airport, I suspect you would get a number that was even larger. Uh, than uh, than 60 percent. So, so we need to spend more. We need a big infrastructure program. Let's just turn before we get to broader solutions to your second main priority, which is rising inequality. Um, it's clearly been the subject of a lot of debate here over the past couple of days. It's a huge. It's kind of hit the zeitgeist very powerfully. The success of Thomas Piketty's book, I think, is testament to that. I've not been to any meeting recently without a large number of people saying they've bought the book. Rather fewer admitting that they've actually read it, but. Uh, most bought it. You wrote a, um, I would say, in wonderful Larry Summers style, not altogether positive review of it, uh, which I read a couple of days ago, saying that it was good, painstaking and very good scholarship in terms of the evidence, uh, less than optimal analysis, and, and I'm going to slightly paraphrase you, rather doubtful solutions. Uh, how big is the problem of inequality? Is it an economic problem, a social problem, a political problem, a bit of all of the above, and what's caused it? I think of inequality as missed opportunity. It's missed opportunity for there to be higher incomes for the vast majority of the population. And I think it is a critically important problem. I think it's very important not to get trapped into a politics of envy. And so I always try to remind people or ask people this question. Suppose America had 50 more people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Would that be good or would that be bad? There's no question that measured inequality would be significantly greater. But I think it's pretty clear that it would be a good thing for America's position in the world. It would be a good thing for the American middle class. 
So it's not that the problem is exactly inequality and whenever something happens that causes more inequality, it should be assumed uh, to be bad. The problem, I think it's better to focus not on tearing anybody down, that's the politics of envy. It's better to focus on how you build uh, the middle class up. And I think that <coughs> I think one part of that is uh, working to have a fairer tax system. I don't think Piketty, Piketty's pro particular proposal for a global wealth tax is especially plan is especially planetary, but I think it does point up two legitimate things. It points up that our existing system is really very squeezed in terms of, very inappropriate in terms of the extent to which income is enabled to avoid taxation and certainly estates are able to, wealth is, allowed, is able to flow uh, without taxation and there's a great deal that can be done to have a system that's more fairly based on ability to pay. And one important what, aspect what of that, that... Do you mean higher income taxes? Do you mean higher inheritance taxes? Do you mean I mean more base? effectively, I think more effectively enforced income and inheritance taxes on income and inheritance as the beneficiaries, uh, as, as the beneficiaries think about uh, their income. I mean, uh, the largest, you know, the largest single issue uh, from this point of view in the United States is uh, unrealized capital gains. You have all kinds of people walking, not all kinds of people, you have a certain number of people uh, who have a net worth of $2 billion whose, if you add up the income they've reported on their tax returns from the time their net worth was zero, it doesn't add up to $150 million. And that's because they own some asset and the asset has kept going up in value. And eventually, what will happen, eventually that asset will be passed to their children and there won't be any tax paid on the income then either uh, because of stepped up, uh, stepped up base. I think there's a lot that can be done uh, in uh, the tax area. But beyond that, I think uh, there's a lot of scope to look at how a larger share of people can be given a stake uh, in uh, the success um, of uh, the economy, worker ownership arrangements, there's one part of that, uh, the investment of national pension funds in uh, assets that earn a higher return than treasury bills is, uh, is another uh, part of that. I think another whole area is a set of rules and policies that serve to protect, uh, protect privilege. I'll give you two examples. Um, I don't think if the copyright on Mickey Mouse lasted only 40 years, we would really have a substantial chilling of entertainment and creativity uh, in uh, the United States. I really don't. And it would contribute to a fairer distribution of income and wealth to have different intellectual property rules. If you look at the wealth figures that Piketty cites, a surprisingly high fraction has to do with appreciation in the value of real estate in hot areas. London, New York, San Francisco, New York, uh, San Francisco. If there were fewer building restrictions on the height of building, on the use of residential land, there'd be more there and the increases in value uh, would be less, as our colleague Ed Glazer has, uh, has, uh, has documented. Um, and so I think there's a great deal that 
reasonable economic liberalization can do that will benefit consumers, that will operate to provide that will operate to provide opportunities, and uh, that will also lead to a fairer distribution of income and wealth. You know, as someone who's about to move to London, I think that's a wonderful idea. <laughs> Get rid of uh, uh, um, restrictions on height. But I'm struck, in that long list of solutions, you didn't mention education. And I think most over the past decade, whenever I've asked people about, you know, what's the antidote to the lack of opportunity to growing income disparities, the standard response has been education. And education has been deemed to be the route to the ladder of opportunity. It's been the, the way to help people in the lower end of the income distribution. What do you think is the role of education now? And I'm going to ask this question um, with some trepidation here. But do you think that institutions like this one are ameliorating inequality or propagating it? Sorry, I felt it needed to be asked. Uh, take the first part of your question first, and then maybe people will forget the second part. <laughs> um, look, I, I could have talked about education. In part, I was looking to say things people hadn't heard before, rather than things people had said or had heard. Uh, a large number of times. In part, though, I think you do have to engage with the facts. And where this discussion has changed, where people think about this importantly differently than they used to, is that the facts are, roughly speaking, that the change in the income of the, 90, of the top 1% relative to the top hundredth of a percent relative to the top one percent, or the top one percent relative to the rest of the top 10 percent, is actually larger than the change in the 90th percentile guy versus the 50th percentile guy, which is actually larger than the change in the 50th percentile person relative to the 10th percentile person. And when you're talking about what's going on at the top hundredth of a percent versus the top tenth of a percent, or even the top one percent versus the top ten percent, they've all been to college, they've all been educated, and so it's not primarily about education. So yes, there's a huge amount we need to do as a country uh, on education in a sentence or two. Uh, my view is both the liberals and the conservatives are right. The uh, conservatives are right that you need more accountability, and the liberals are right uh, that you need uh, more money. And I think the whole thing requires a philosophical change back to the idea that achievement is a source of self-esteem and towards less emphasis on the idea that self-esteem is a source of achievement. And I do not exempt, I do not exempt a university where the most common grade is A from that particular uh, critique of, uh, the of the educational uh, system. So I, think, so I am all for education reform. I just don't think it's realistic to think that with all the best education reform in the world, this problem is going to uh, go away or these issues are not going to arise. What about um, uh, universities uh, as, uh, I think obviously that universities, universities like this one are enormously benign forces um, and in part, Framing it in terms of inequality isn't quite right for the reason I said. If we're training and causing there to be uh, more uh, Steve Jobses and Bill Gates, there might even be a little more inequality. But we're making for a much for making for a much better world. The thing I'm probably proudest of having done 
uh, while I was president here was establishing the principle that any student could come to Harvard uh, with an income under $60,000 without paying anything at all, precisely because I thought we needed to be a source of equal opportunity and that we needed to give the same kind of focus in admissions to supporting students from economically disadvantaged backgrounds that we had historically given to uh, supporting students from racially uh, disadvantaged, uh, uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds. I thought when I was president and was able to move things a certain amount, though not nearly as far as I would have liked to, that it was ironic, and that's a very polite word for how I actually felt, that you could get far more financial aid from Harvard University to study at the business school to be an investment banker than you could to study at the Kennedy School uh, to be a civil servant or to start an NGO. And we started a set of processes of redistribution because we felt that we needed to address uh, that kind, uh, to address that uh, kind of issue. Look, I think there's, I think if, I think the big issue before universities in this regard is look, uh, Harvard has at any, uh, has at any moment 20,000 students and it is a huge world. The university that is going to be the university that has a vast impact on equality is going to be the university that uses the web to have five million students or 50 million uh, students. But that's going to require an imagination and a, uh, and a boldness that uh, we don't always see. You know, Clay Christensen, our colleague at the business school, has written very powerfully on how it's always like Kodak missing out on digital because you never do things that are threatening to your existing uh, leadership. And that's when you have the profit incentive. When you don't have the profit incentive, it's even harder to disrupt uh, the existing way. So I think that universities are positive, but frankly, I think our leading universities are probably underachieving in terms of the kind of contribution uh, they can make uh, to ameliorating inequality. Thank you. I'm now going to open to questions. There are. Um, three mics there, and just as you go to the mics, I'm going to ask you one last one, um, but please do come up to the mics. Listening to you here and looking back over the last, in some ways we are now in a period in terms of economic change and, and potentially social change as dramatic as the beginning of the 20th century, the progressive era. There we had huge policy response, really very dramatic. After the Second World War, we had huge policy response to the GI Bill, universal secondary education at the beginning of the 20th century. When I look now at what government's doing, and I'm conscious I'm at the Kennedy School of Government, it's kind of small ball. Washington is, if it's doing anything at all, it's very small ball. Why is that? Just, and I know we'll, we'll open to, to more questions, but just to end this first part, tell me why is the magnitude of the debate and the ambition of the solutions so feeble compared to even what you've just been, been describing in the last half hour? Is it the political system? Is it the failure of business and government? What, what, what's causing it? Let me talk about two things. Um, the late uh, Alexander Gershenkrupp, who was a very distinguished professor of economic history um, for 40 years or so in our economics department, wrote a very famous essay called The Economic Advantage of Backwardness. And he basically explained why Germany surpassed uh, the United Kingdom in the late 19th century. Basically by saying that when new technologies got invented, 
if you didn't have any factories, you built a new factory with really good, with, that was well adapted to the new technology. And if you had existing factories, you tried to cludge them in, and it didn't work as well. And so when you've got a lot of space filled, it's much harder uh, to uh, do new things. You know, at some point, the telecommunications system of a number of backward countries is going to be a lot better than ours because it's going to be relying entirely on wireless. And that's a metaphor for a much broader uh, phenomenon. Uh, there was a lot more empty canvas for Teddy Roosevelt to, to paint on at a time when government was 3% of uh, GDP and whole states were essentially unoccupied uh, than there is for governments today. So I think that's one part of it. I think a second uh, part of it is uh, that there is a need, and this is something that's been some of the most important work that's been done at uh, the Center for Business uh, and uh, Government over uh, the last decade. There is a need for approaches that transcend and that combine efforts in uh, the public and private sector. You know, if you think about it, uh, to use the phrase that Frank Weil uh, coined, World War II was a triumph of collaborative governance. It was a triumph of close collaboration between uh, business and uh, government, in which government didn't try to produce the airplanes itself, and business understood that the decisions as to just what airplanes were going to be produced needed to be made on broad strategic uh, grounds. That's a particularly extreme uh, example. The Lewis and Clark expedition was a public-private cooperation. The Trans-Pacific, uh, the, tran um, the Trans-Pacific Railroad was Transcontinental uh, Railroad to the Pacific was a collaboration of uh, the public and the private uh, sector. There are all kinds of much smaller successes in the schools, repairing parks uh, in uh, New York that involve uh, that kind of uh, collaboration. Now, it doesn't come without risks. Um, the private shareholders are properly motivated uh, to make money. And they may make money at the expense of government in collaboration. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, on their way to leading the nation's housing market to ruin, would have described themselves as triumphs of public and private sector collaboration. So the questions of how we um, do this in ways that take, advan take advantage, foster the kinds of connections, forge practical uh, solutions, are I think as important as any other if uh, we're going to get to the kind of bolder and more imaginative solutions. And that's something where uh, a number of people uh, at the Kennedy School, uh, Richard Zeckhauser and John Donahue and many others, have done uh, very, very uh, important, uh, important work. And I think there's a great deal uh, left to do, particularly in making that model more practical. Thank you. I could carry on asking questions for a long time, but it's now time to open. This gentleman was here first, and then you second, sir. Could you introduce yourself and keep it reasonably brief? Hi, my name is Francisco Almendra. I am an MPAD here at the Kennedy School, who graduated five years ago and back here for the reunion. Really happy to be here. Thank you to have this opportunity to, to listen to you, have this fantastic conversation. Um, so we heard already a little bit about technology and um, specifically about how 
um, some universities and some companies, large companies, large universities, have kind of missed the beat on where the opportunities lie and how difficult it is to adapt to a new paradigm of, of technology or interaction, right? Um, so my question was a little bit beyond that to ask your views about, even for government or decision making or living together society, um, if you could share a few thoughts about um, what are the missed opportunities if they are there and how can we adapt society, specifically public decision making, to, to take into account what technology is already doing in many different countries in the world and will continue to do so? Take, for example, Arab That's Spring. That's a, a very narrow question. Place. Wow. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Larry. Uh, I'll just say, I'm not sure I can, I'm sure I cannot do justice to all that, all that you have in mind. I guess I would say that one of the lessons that I've learned uh, for governments and for institutions is that you can either try to do the union of all, the intersection of all the things that no one objects to too strongly. It's one way forward. You, you kind of, you only do stuff if everybody kind of agrees. Or you can try to do all the things that some people think will be fantastically beneficial and monitor things carefully and cut off things that don't work. And I think we have a tendency in institutions that have been around in a long time and in governments that have been around for a long time to tend towards the first model, the promiscuous availability of the veto. And I think that we would do better if we were more prepared to support things that somebody believed passionately would uh, be good. And uh, it's, if you like, uh, the venture capital model of uh, success. A uh, venture capital company that didn't have any wipeouts would review its portfolio and conclude that it had not chosen its portfolio well because it had not gone far enough towards making bold choices. It's a very good line. The promiscuous availability of the veto. Thank Second you. question. Uh, my name is Pat Lawson, uh, MPA uh, 89. So if you look at uh, political economies, uh, let's say abstractly on a continuum with uh, let's say China on one end of the continuum with the command economy and the United States on the other end with, say, a democratic economy. Uh, the argument has been made that because of the, <clears throat> the changes in the complexity of the world recently, that there's some advantages that have been shifted to a more uh, command economy versus our traditional <clears throat> uh, democratic economy. So, uh, and you've talked a little bit alluded to the uh, policies that are coming out with respect to allocation of capital long term specifically. So my question would be, do you think that, uh, that we would be better off if there were some shift in that uh, uh, United States along that sort of continuum? The allure of China. Mostly no. Um, the the argument you just made is not a new one. Um, when, people, when people noted that Mussolini made the trains run on time, that was the argument. When people noted that uh, Russian growth was two and a half times as fast as American growth in the 1950s, and the Samuelson textbook predicted in 1961 that uh, Russia would, with about 50% probability, have higher GDP than the United States by the early 1980s, that was the rationale. When every issue of the Harvard Business Review in 1991 contained a version of the joke that the Cold War was over and uh, Japan had won, that was, essentially, uh, that, was a, that was essentially the argument. So I think the evidence is that um, you can, it's, it's, it's in many ways like 
um, uh, looking at investment success over a short period of time. If you look at the most successful people, if you look at all the people who invested money last year, I promise none of the ones who are most successful will be people who held diversified portfolios. They'll be people who bet on something confidently. But if you look at the people who were most successful at investing over 25 or 50 years, they will almost always be people who did diversify. And what a democratic system does and a decentralized marketplace uh, does is uh, permit the um, permit that kind of uh, diversification. You know, there's a very revealing uh, fact. I remember when I first uh, learned this, it sort of affected my thinking a lot, which is there's an old argument. It's not quite your argument, but it's fairly closely related, which is that a great thing about having the government run everything is that then you can internalize all the externalities because if, if I'm a company and Zanny's a company and David's a company, then we'll all just do bad things that have externalities. But if, the government, but if there's one person who's sort of running it all in command, then we'll internalize all the externalities. And so that's why that theory would imply that the more socialist your country is, the better you would be at dealing with environmental problems. And of course, even the most casual bit of empiricism about the former Soviet Union or China today would reveal that exactly the opposite is the case. So are there places where we make decisions too slowly? Of course. Are there places where we could foster some collaboration valuably? Yes. But is there any reason to think that moving to a more authoritarian model systematically would improve performance. I am very skeptical of that proposition. And I would add one last thing, which is that if you look at such successes as that model has, they are always when you're trying to catch up, when you're trying to import something that already exists somewhere else, and not when you're trying to create something new. So I am one who does not succumb to China envy. Uh, yes, question there. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Summers. Thank you for your time and your insights here today. Um, my name is Brooke Ellison. I'm a MVP class of 2004, as well as a uh, World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. So it's great to, to experience all of you, uh, to, to share this afternoon. Um, but you had mentioned very briefly the Affordable Care Act and uh, how it's kind of creeping along. And I think I joined many others in my enthusiasm about uh, seeing the um, enrollment numbers headed in, um, to March 31st, the enrollment deadline uh, kind of outperform what was expected. Um, but I guess the Affordable Care Act can be looked at and like many other pieces of legislation, kind of like a step or kind of a, a, um, a manifestation of past dependence. And um, my question to you was whether you see this as a step towards um, a single payer kind of universalized system or kind of the instantiation of the idiosyncratic you know, US model that's, um, that ties uh, health care to employment, and then kind of a corollary to that is, do you, do you think that the model that the U.S. has had in place over the years historically, this, you know, kind of vision of health care as um, an earned privilege rather than a right is, uh, has been uh, beneficial, or if not, how you would see it done differently? Thank you. That's a great question. Is it a step towards single payer? The, for better or for worse, the way to understand the Affordable Care Act is if you give a set of technical experts the problem, get to universal health care with as little change and disruption in the existing system as possible, what they will produce is essentially the Affordable Care Act. Because what they will say is everybody who has health insurance doesn't have health insurance, has to buy it, that you have to mandate it to control adverse selection, that you have to subsidize it for poor people, and then that you have to penalize people, businesses who drop health insurance, so they don't all abandon uh, 
their health insurance. So essentially, that's the way to understand. That's the logic that got Mitt Romney to uh, this plan in Massachusetts half a dozen years ago. Um, and that's the reason why that's what the Affordable Care Act is. So that's the way to understand why we got there. Um, will we stay there? My guess is that over time, but it will be a gradual process, a larger and larger fraction of health care will come to run through the exchanges. And a smaller fraction of health care will be paid for at the employer level. I think you will see evolution uh, in that direction. I'd be a little surprised if you saw revolution uh, in that direction. Will that get all the way to uh, single, uh, single payer? I certainly don't think it'll get all the way to single payer and provider on uh, the British model. And I think the events of the last two months at the, in the VA healthcare system uh, only reinforce the sense that in the United States it probably shouldn't get to that uh, point. Will it get that way uh, more in uh, terms of universal Medicare, if you like? Um, I think that's going to be a slow, I think that's going to be a very slow process uh, if, uh, if it comes, uh, would, be my, uh, would be my judgment. And I'm agnostic on, I'm agnostic to skeptical about whether it would be a, a good thing. Um, should health care be a right or a uh, privilege? Basic health care should be a right. Thank you. I've been trying quietly here to negotiate two more questions, but I've failed. So I am so sorry, but this gentleman has been waiting a long time. I'm really sorry. I'm only allowed one more question. It's yours, sir. Thank you. Larry, it's always mind-opening to listen to you, so I really envy the people who get to hang around you all the time. Um, my question is on the thesis of inequality. Um, a data point that I've read is that the lower quartile of income earners today lead a much more comfortable lifestyle than the wealthiest people did over 100 years ago. If that is true, um, why does society make such a big deal about income inequality when the same range exists in sports ability, athletic you know, capability, musical talent, intellectual talent, et cetera. Why do we grudge uh, David Rubenstein his billions? Uh, Not to put too <laughs> fine a point on it. Thank you, Larry, that's a. Given his generosity in sharing them with the Kennedy School. Exactly. <laughs> I, for one, wish to say that I approve of David Rubenstein's billions. <laughs> and I would say uh, with, some, uh, with some seriousness that if all of David's colleagues in the Forbes 400 um, displayed the same thoughtful energy around deploying their good fortune to make the world a better place, that I think it would affect general thinking about inequality uh, in, a very important, uh, in a very important way. So when I praise the thing, da things David's doing and that many others are doing, um, it's not just uh, trying to make a nice uh, statement. It's reflecting something that I think is uh, very, uh, is very important. I guess the question is, uh, would be something like this. Um, how do you feel about lacking a fax machine when no one else has a fax machine? And how do you feel about lacking a fax machine when everyone else has a fax, has a fax machine? How do you feel about lacking a cell phone when everyone doesn't have a cell phone? And how do you feel about lacking a cell phone in a society where almost everyone else uh, does have, a, um, uh, does have uh, a cell phone? And I could multiply uh, 
those, uh, those kinds of uh, examples. So I think you're right. Um, a child of a Rockefeller in uh, 1900 was at risk of a septic infection and could die of a uh, infection incurred in a cut, um, whereas no child in America who couldn't, who couldn't be taken to an emergency room would uh, face that possibility. You are, absolute, you are absolutely right. But I think that it is the case um, that our social construction of what is reasonable and decent uh, evolves. It evolves in terms of what groups can be fully included in our society, as we've seen in the revolution with respect to gay rights in the last five years. That's a process uh, that is continuing. And what kinds of economic opportunities and economic capacities constitute full participation in the society evolves as uh, the uh, evolve <coughs> evolves as the society evolves. So I think there is something that is inherently somewhat relative about uh, the measurement and the definition of a satisfactory, um, uh, of, a, of a satisfactory living standard, or maybe to put the point uh, in a, slightly less serious way, an economy is a little like a poker game, and it's hard to have a very interesting poker game when one person has all the chips, um, or a very interesting poker game when a small number of the participants have the vast majority of, uh, the, uh, of the chips. Thank you. You know, just as a follow-up, I wonder frequently whether this is in the minds of every person or it's planted there by politicians? If you're going to answer it, you have to answer oh. very briefly or I'm going to be in serious trouble here. I don't think anybody who has more than one child can believe that envy is not a fairly important human emotion even when it is not stoked up. And so I don't think it's all politicians. Thanks very much for the Thank chance to be with you. Thank you very much indeed. So thank you very much, uh, Zanny and Larry, for a terrific uh, interview and discussion. Um, let me uh, say that this was supposed to be a discussion of the economy, and obviously it was, and economic issues, but you can see it's really a a look into a beautiful mind, which obviously Larry has. And uh, for those of you who would like to have a similarly beautiful mind, um, contributing to the Kennedy School Capital <laughs> Campaign, um, by osmosis, we think it will help you get a mind closer to Larry's than any way else you can get one. So, David, David, I, I think that a majority of the people in this room might prefer to have your net worth <laughs> than to have my mind. Uh, <laughs> and so I'm wondering what you can do in I, that regard. I, I doubt it. And uh, <laughs> money doesn't buy happiness, I can assure you. Most of the rich people I know are very miserable. Um, <laughs> so um, let me say thank you for a terrific conversation. And I want to thank um, everybody for coming. We have a, a program that is going to continue uh, throughout this afternoon. Everybody should have been scheduled for a lunch at one of the centers. It'll begin around 1 o'clock. We'll have very interesting discussions there. And then if you want dessert, you have to come back here. And we're having a reception back here that will begin around 2.30. And at 2.45, we'll hear from the dean of the Kennedy School, uh, David L. Wood, and we'll say some uh, additional things. But I want to thank everybody who helped put this together. And thank Larry and Zanny for doing this. Thank you. Thank you.